right, everybody. I guess we should be. Uh, I guess we should be live. Um, I'm just gonna start uh, sketching away, and hopefully, I'll be able to sort out any technical issues. All right. So, by the way, this uh, stream is going on on YouTube primarily, but I have like a secondary stream going on Instagram, where probably the quality is not gonna be as amazing. Um, but uh, for those of you that are watching on Instagram, you can always like. Uh, come watch the rest of it on uh, on YouTube. Uh, for those of you on YouTube, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try my best to like kind of see the comments that you put in, but uh, maybe I don't get them. So uh, definitely no offense to you if I, uh, if I don't wind up getting to your question. And if you hear a mouse click or two, um, that's just uh, part of the production. Uh, by the way, if anybody could give me just a thumbs up on the audio quality being okay, I just wanna make sure my mic's working because I shut off the, the audio on my on my desktop uh, so that I don't like create a weird like reverb kind of thing. So just any thumbs up in the comments would be great for me and uh, for everybody on Instagram who's um, I guess probably a little bit more able to uh, um, yeah, tell me that that sounds okay, that'd be cool too. Uh, right, so I'm just gonna dive in today. I'm gonna be drawing, uh, uh, just kind of sketching an eye because I'm doing a painting right now and I kind of need to uh, do a little bit more research on um, on one of the eyes. So, uh, oh yeah, let me <laughs> let me switch to the the demo screen so you can actually see what I'm doing. Um, maybe that would be uh, useful for the uh, YouTube watchers, right? Um, yeah. So, like I said, I'm just gonna be sketching an eye to start out and um, uh, kind of doing a study for a painting that I'm that I'm working on right now. There's this kind of eye on the left hand side or sorry on the right hand side it's the model's like left hand eye that i'm uh, a little bit less than totally certain about so um always in those cases like doing a study is really uh is really useful um i'm also going to try my absolute best uh <laughs> this is both for my sake and my video editor's sake to not say um as much as possible if any of you, I don't know, maybe some of you are YouTube, or sorry, not YouTube, but uh, Patreon subscribers to me already, you know, like I've been doing a lot of audio work for the last couple of years. But one of the things, one of the habits that dies like really hard is saying um all the time in order to like kind of catch my breath or, or kind of catch up while I'm, uh, while I'm thinking and kind of talking on my feet. Some of you are asking also like what uh, what I'm drawing on. So I have a 24 inch Cintiq Pro by Wacom. And so I'm drawing on that uh, and I'm using Photoshop. I use just like a really super generic brush, nothing at all fancy. In fact, I just use one brush and multiple sizes. So if you can see like, uh, if you can see here, like these are my brush settings. I just have like different levels of opacity and like a couple different sizes on it. So honestly, really like nothing, uh, nothing too intense, just especially because I kind of want to treat this more like an analog experience. Like I'm, I'm primarily an analog artist. And while I like kind of digital work, I think that it has really a, um, it has really a lot of, uh, like places it can go and just in terms of the way you're able to kind of communicate with people through it it's so immediate like for instance like live streaming right now i'm able to bring you like a really high resolution with kind of low latency and um really get you kind of up close to the experience as far as like analog live streaming that's possible too and i have definitely equipment that i use for that but i think that uh, again the digital experience is one that that I think is really good for uh, for two D artists, probably for three D artists as well. I've never um, I've never actually interacted uh, uh, with any kind of three D programs, so uh, so I wouldn't really know. By the way, just in terms of this process, you see me kind of starting out with this uh, with this kind of sphere underneath. I find that like when I'm doing a study of an eye, for instance, that that's actually really useful, primarily because. I'm going to need to uh, to understand like where the parameters of the eye are going to be before I have too much kind of on the page. So that just kind of helps me to understand 
like where the where the kind of split is going to be because in a sense like we look at the eye right as a as a sphere like this the eyelids are really just like an opening on top of that on top of that sphere right so they kind of go around it like this and uh um, kind of show us just a little bit of the eye and uh, the rest of that kind of sphere is like the iceberg kind of below the surface so that's why I kind of start out with that um, with that sphere let's see I need to like uh, I think dial in just a little bit of value to kind of start out because a lot of this eye is on the kind of shadow side of the face and I want to I want to use, I want to indicate some of that here because it's such a big part of kind of what the theme or the kind of story of this eye is. And this is something I would recommend whether you're working kind of digitally or analog is that you start to introduce like a value theme kind of straight away. You don't want to wait too long, I think, you know, in between, you know, doing a, um, doing like an analog, uh, or sorry, not analog, but uh, doing like a, a linear study uh, for too long, if you know eventually that your, your painting or your drawing or whatever is going to be a full kind of value expression. So uh, for me, I'm just trying to stay conscious of efficiency and making sure that I don't, you know, wind up kind of slowing myself down, so to speak, like when I don't have to. Uh, you know, it already takes long enough to, to actually draw things. So if there's anything I can do to kind of speed up that process within reason, I'm going to do that. Does that make sense? I hope everybody's like uh, um, expecting <laughs> that I, you know, I work. I work, I, I would say that I work like relatively slowly. I feel like I'm a slow worker, but maybe maybe that's kind of relative. I know that. I've been doing this stuff for a while, so in one sense, I'm, I have some speed about it, but, but like any analog work that you do, it's just going to take some, some time eventually. I actually need to move the, uh, I need to move this down a little bit. I don't know if I have enough space. Hmm. Well, we're going to, whoa. <laughs> I just knocked my Instagram camera over. Um, technical difficulty. One second. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. So back to business. I'm just gonna work with the the space that I have, and uh, hopefully make a decent eye inside of that. Yeah. For those of you watching on Instagram, like I, I'm unfortunately I can't really see your uh, your comments at the moment, so you'll have to forgive me that I can't. Uh, I can't really communicate anything there. I also need to get like a little bit of a lighter value. By the way, also like, I don't think I've ever done a live stream on, on YouTube, at least not like a public one. So this is, this is like the beginning of, uh, of doing that. So I hope that this is like the normal version of, of what happens during YouTube live streams. Um, uh, but you guys can tell me in the comments as well, like if you have stuff that you want to talk about or something or whatever is interesting to you. I am all ears for that. Um, so I think I'd like to actually do a lot more of these. Uh, I, I think that live streams like a really great way to kind of reach out to to people uh, to kind of grow an audience. And you know, I've been working a long time, not a long time. I've been working a little while on YouTube to kind of just grow an audience there and, and kind of share videos. So if you're kind of into the stuff that I do, there, there should be enough stuff there on YouTube that you can kind of get a sense of, of where I'm coming from. And hopefully, uh, hopefully that's kind of enough to, to introduce kind of where I'm at. I don't know if everybody watching this is already kind of familiar with what I do in general. So maybe some of it's not too, uh, not too surprising. Um, by the way, also, if you are watching this either on, uh, on Instagram or on, uh, on YouTube, um, please remember to subscribe to my channel. Uh, it really, uh, um, really helps me and just in terms of kind of growing an audience there, it gives me the opportunity to like do more stuff. 
and uh, to kind of share more content. So if you are into this stuff and into like learning about this stuff in general, then uh, please feel free to subscribe and, uh, and I'll be there. So uh, let's see, let's get a good question here. I think there's some like coming in. Uh, someone's asking on Instagram, what's a good uh, starter digital media, uh, like like where to start with digital hardware? Whew, wow, that's like a great question. In a way, like I started, I started doing this actually because I was starting out on Patreon and I was working uh, like a mentorship program there, which you know, has become, I think, really rather popular. Uh, so there's not really a lot of spots uh, available very often. But if you're into that kind of thing, you know, uh, you can always kind of check me out on Patreon. But what I was going to say was that I, I started out doing this. I just needed a way that I could share my screen with, um, with people so that I could, like, look at their work and, like, critique their work and stuff. And so I just started out actually uh, with an iPad Pro. Um, actually, I don't even know if I had an iPad Pro. I think I had like a regular iPad, but this was right around the time that that iPad was like kind of coming out with the uh, the Apple Pencil and stuff. I know like a million years ago back when I started doing this, but um, so I just started out with an iPad Pro and an Apple Pencil and just started out kind of drawing like that and using an app called Procreate, which uh, probably if you do anything on an iPad, then you know what Procreate is. In terms of like kind of growing with your technology, I, in retrospect, I feel like I just should have started Photoshop earlier because really it's the industry standard, it's what everybody uses. And eventually I had to kind of get up to speed with Photoshop, or I'm still getting up to speed, by the way, like still uh, figuring out um, how to do all that stuff. But an iPad with Procreate is probably more than enough. Let's see, B. Gill, or no, wait a minute, there's a question coming in uh, uh, that is in a language that I don't know, the, the, at least your, um, your uh, screen name is in a language I don't understand, but it says, question says, how is Russian academic drawing different from European academic drawing? I think it's kind of a cool question and it probably kind of depends upon what era you're talking about. If you mean like 19th century European versus like contemporary European, I should also like say within that, that, um, you know, I've only studied, uh, uh, contemporary European, um, uh, academic drawing and painting. So, you know, in, in that sense, I can only tell you kind of one one side of that story. Uh, uh, based on experience, the other I would just have to say is um, uh, just from observing the work and kind of making a comparison that way. Uh, at the school that I studied, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, visual impression, right? So basically, you know, when you squint down and look at something, like, what do you see? So a lot of it was like value and kind of mass based. And as I understand it, the kind of Russian academic tradition is a lot more kind of structural, probably has a lot more in common with the way that like in the West, like animators and illustrators are trained. Uh, at least that's the impression that I get. I mean that, um, as certainly for me as a compliment, I find that the you know the structural basis for design is uh, leaves you in a stronger, more kind of confident place than than the visual one. Uh, everybody can have like of course a very different opinion about that, but mine, uh, very simply put, is that I feel like learning structural drawing uh, gives you a lot more what's the word like breadth in like what you're able to express. Uh, and, and, you know, the different kind of situations that you're able to kind of cope with. Uh, whereas like if you're working visually in a way, it doesn't tie your hands, but it, it teaches you to operate, I think in one very specific set of circumstances. And if you're not in that set of circumstances, like if you're, you know, you find yourself outdoors or you're in a different kind of studio or something. 
I think that you're a little bit less inclined to be able to adapt very well to that situation. So that's just my take on it. I think that one is going to be a lot more structural in the way that it prepares you to uh, to kind of see and, and design things that you see. And another is going to be a lot more visual and I, I would prefer the uh, I prefer the structural to the visual if I had to choose between the two. Reality is you can just, um, you can just, uh, what's the word? You can choose both. I mean, with the way that, that things go in terms of like online learning nowadays, like you don't really, like you really have to choose very much in between like, you know, which one you would, you would like to follow. You can get so much out there nowadays. Like there's great courses online and, and there's really a fantastic sense of like community out there as far as like learning online goes. Yeah, I, so I took a long time to answer that one. Uh, Joe is asking, what do you think you've retained in your art from Egon Sheila? That's a good question. Yeah, so Joe's probably referring to the fact that like really early on in my uh, my life as an artist, uh, I was really into Egon Sheila. It was probably one of my first influences uh, in terms of like just artists that I looked at and I, I thought was, was kind of cool. So what I've retained from that? Uh, well, it's a fair question. I mean, it's hard to say, though. I wonder, I, I think you asked me that question maybe even five or six years ago. Uh, I think the, que the answer would be like really, really different. Uh, nowadays, I'm not actually sure that I really do retain a whole lot from my appreciation of Egon Schiele. I don't mean that in like a sad way. I just mean that like, I, you know, it's just not really on my my radar right now. I think that I definitely have an appreciation for the use of line in uh, in my work, and uh, certainly I feel like in in his work that has a really strong theme as well. But as far as painting is concerned, I feel like I've really probably diverged a lot from my initial kind of inspiration with uh, with Sheila. Does everybody out there like know Egon Sheila, by the way? I don't know if that's even a name that uh, that um, everybody will know. Uh, the Draftsman asks, I'm doing a study on your work, so what do you think the best approach to study your work and your technique? Well, I mean, studying my work uh, probably, this is, not, this is not a plug at all, but, um, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm very academic. I worked in ateliers for like 12 years uh, teaching and, and four years studying before that. So all of these things that, that I'm doing have a really uh, specific set of ideas that are trying to be expressed. And while you, I, I'm, I'm not going to say, oh, you need to subscribe to my Patreon. It's not that, but... I do have a definitions list there for free. And if you go to like the FAQ, the frequently asked questions post on my Patreon, you can find uh, uh, that vocabulary list there. I think you can download it as a PDF. Uh, I would recommend just to get a hold of that because a lot of what's in there is my kind of how I talk about how I would organize the visual world. Uh, which is a major theme in in my work. And I think a lot of the, I guess a lot of like the artistic stuff that I do as well, uh, it kind of comes out of that 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 place where I'm looking at visual phenomenon, I'm looking at the world, and I'm looking at it in a very particular way. And the more that you understand that, I think the easier it's going to be for you to actually get the most out of out of studying my work. Because you know, I think if we're studying an artist's work we want to kind of get down to the bottom of like how do they think about about the visual world like how do they see what they see you want to kind of figure that out and i think if you don't have if you know if there's like a map <laughs> that's like available to you already i think you gotta you gotta take that uh, i mean if there was like imagine if right like uh there was out there a definitions list from like John Singer Sargent, which by the way, I'm not like comparing myself to that, but just to say like some great artist in history, if, if they had just left behind a vocabulary list, 
I would really want to know what was on their vocabulary list. I'd be really curious to uh, to kind of find that out. So that's what, what my recommendation would be if you want to study what, what I'm doing. So maybe Todd's asking, how often do you squint down? It depends on the project. Now, now what Todd's talking about here uh, with squinting down is that to assess values, right? A lot of times what you'll do, and we're just talking about the relative lightness and darkness, lightness or darkness of a particular area. A lot, you, a lot of times you want to squint down and reduce the amount of light that's kind of coming into your eyes. So you're kind of squinting down like this, right? Now, how often you do that? I've. It's an interesting question because there's going to be several kind of schools of thought about this. And I'll just give you kind of my take on it because, I mean, that's obviously why, why we're here. But um, I think that in a way, squinting down is a procedure that you perform not because that is the only way to observe the world but because it is a useful assistance when you're trying to figure out how to see the world so what i'm getting at is i may not squint down quite as often as when i was a student just trying to figure out how visual phenomenon worked that does not mean at all that squinting down is less important to me it's just that I guess I kind of squint down in my mind rather than always just doing it on uh, yeah, just with my eyes. Let's see, there's some uh, more questions. Uh, I'm trying to find one that maybe is... Um, is most interesting. Uh, someone's asking if um, I have like a lot of model packs on my Patreon and they're asking just if if it's okay that they post on social media with work that they made from those model packs. Yeah, it's totally fine. The model packs are there just for you guys. I don't, you know, uh, whatever work I'm making, you know, I, I, you know, I use those same model packs and, but that's, you know, that's part of, uh, I think, you know, studying with me. It's just that, of course, that you get those as well. Uh, so no worries about that at all. Uh, Cleum is asking, would you say that starting drawings is better? Would you say that starting drawings is better to that the structure is good before the next steps? So it'd be better to prioritize the improvement of the structure before thinking about finalizing. Well, definitely, you know, if we're talking about like stages in a drawing, yeah, you want to make sure your structure is sound before you, you think about finishing a drawing, but it's it's almost like, you know, these things, I think in a perfect world, they're, they're actually kind of going hand in hand. Like, I think getting the structure right is a part of finalizing or finishing. You know, I have this kind of progressive idea about drawing that you don't, um, what's the word? You don't like get the the drawing right and then finish it. It's more that that finishing the drawing is a part of like kind of getting it right. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that uh, you know yes and no. The the yes part being absolutely structure is super important. You have to prioritize it. If you're not prioritizing it it's not going to get done and your drawing is going to suffer because of that. However, separating it into a stage and saying, now I'm done with the structure, I can finish my drawing is also like not totally correct. You have to think about structure, I think all the time. And in fact, like it's where I probably spend the majority of my time in drawing is just trying to figure out the planes and the structure. By the way, let's say like what the structure is. Structure is essentially just like a three-dimensional model for, for reality. Uh, because uh, we're kind of facing one of the primary problems of a 2D artist, and that is that your world is flat, and the world that you're trying to represent is round. And you are, that puts you immediately, in a way, at a disadvantage and so you need to like work towards fixing that, right? So we start off in this flat world, 
and we want to represent a three-dimensional world and so that means that there's a whole lot of choices that we have to take like along the way to that um, structure is one of the primary ways that we kind of understand around the world right so uh, if we for instance let's take like an example here this is one I use with my students all the time is that you can have a shape like this that is totally flat right this is a totally 2d shape uh, it's just as if I had drawn like a shape like this totally flat no form whatsoever now structure what we're looking for in terms of like what structure is uh, is to find the three-dimensionality find the the wireframe kind of pattern that indicates that that three-dimensional form uh, so that's that's really all, all that we're saying with with structure and uh, so then to the to the question that was asked uh, your all your time is is structure I think uh, and that's not to be like unfair to the question it's a fair question but the reality is that um, you'll find probably all of your time doing that. Or eventually, like I found, just more and more time uh, uh, where I just spend searching for structure, working on structure. Even when I'm you know, using values or whatever it is, still working on structure. Speaking of which, I need to like really work on the structure in this eye. It looks woof, tough. Need to get that... Uh, classic sense of form going right maybe we do a little bit of a little bit of a diagram here so you, can, you guys can see what I'm kind of looking for so if, if I'm looking at this eye I want to think about these kind of center lines down the eye and they're kind of showing the structure of the eye from this kind of perspective right and you can do that also over here so all the values that I'm trying to use are going to be values that are here to kind of represent these particular kind of set of planes right so let's think about kind of connecting this together you can see like pretty clearly what happens to this plane we have this downward facing plane here we have an upward facing plane here so what is the light going to do how is it going to react to those uh, those areas it's pretty simple right but this is the the joy of kind of like understanding uh, structure eventually is that you um, you have the capacity to create values that are very meaningful and uh, um, communicate the form like very efficiently by the way like all of this stuff uh, again not to um, not to plug too much but uh, all of this stuff you can find like on my my patreon page so um there's a lot of info about this by the way i can't back up to get rid of this so i just now i have to draw over <laughs> my this red line that i put like in the middle of my uh of my drawing there's still like i'm i'm totally like a um a new user to to photoshop so there's some things that still like mystify me about it uh hopefully that doesn't interrupt anybody's experience too much if anybody out there by the way if you have like the best photoshop tip sheet in the world you know just let me know <laughs> uh, but yeah I was just gonna say I was kinda gonna get into the structure and kinda indicate some of these the depth of some of these planes hopefully and uh, hopefully we get to a decent looking eye for me, this is, uh, I feel like it's a little bit, it's a little bit rough. Uh, it's probably because I'm kind of talking while I'm doing it. I'm not, not usually as efficient, you know, when I'm talking and, and working at the same time, but that's okay. By the way, I know there's been like a ton of questions popping in. Uh, so I know I'm like not getting to all of them, so sorry about that, but. Oh, someone says that I can increase the amount of undos in the settings. Super awesome tip. Thanks for that. Uh, Paige Emerson's asking for tips for toning paper with graphite charcoal smoothly before drawing. 
there is, you know, this is going to sound like I'm a little bit on repeat, but I've, I've been doing Patreon for a couple of years now. So a lot of the questions that I'm getting, like I've already made tutorials, like full lessons about all of that stuff. The, I have one on, on uh, materials. So on pa all the papers that I use, all the pencils that I use, stuff like that. It's totally exhaustive. It's like a two hour video and everything that I have to say about paper is represented there, uh, including toning it and stuff like that. So uh, you can absolutely go to my Patreon page and find the uh, materials videos there. Um, uh, which by the way, you can use, you can do wet or dry toning. It kind of depends upon what effect you want and, and kind of how you want to work. I, I tend to prefer kind of, I think dry toning just because it gives me a little bit more kind of flexibility, but there's something to be said for, for wet toning, even if you're using uh, just graphite or charcoal powder to do it as well. Uh, some really interesting effects that you can get when you kind of uh, tone it wet as well. So just to say that um, all that stuff is out there. Let's see. <laughs> this is a funny question. Um, what is the best phase of the drawing that you enjoy the most? And then someone's asking, how did you decide to go with the form or against the form when hatching? And then another question about, am I drawing on paper or computer or what? Uh, I'm definitely drawing on a computer. Uh, so that takes care of that one. The uh, other questions with hatching, you know, there's some very specific answers that you can, that you can have to that though. They're kind of hard to describe because they're they're not universal. Like I, when I give an advice that's like, how do you hatch? I like to be able to say, well, this is how in every situation you can hatch. But you'll see that I'll go with the form or against the form, you know, in, you know, at different times. And so there's a little bit of a sense of it. it's kind of a hard advice to give about like, how do you hatch? Because there's a lot of different things that kind of go into that. Like sometimes I'm hatching really just to kind of search out the form to like find a crease or a kind of movement in the form. And it's not really value based. But then some, sometimes I'm hatching for the sake of value, like over here, where I would be like hatching to show how this plane is kind of dipping down and another one is like kind of wrapping around the edge there like that. Right. So there's a lot of different kind of ways you can hatch. You can even uh, at times, you know, you can you can hatch like along with the form like this as well. So there's a lot of different answers. It's not really like a how do you hatch uh, lesson that that I give necessarily. So uh, I mean, that's you know, there's some guidelines there. Though. Hopefully, that's uh, that that's helpful. Let's see. But I gotta get I gotta get this on the way, man, like I'm way behind where I should be. Like I said, talking and drawing, you know, it's not easy. But I think, you know, I'd, like I said it before, I'd, I'd like to do more, uh, more live streams on, on YouTube. I just think it's kind of a cool thing because you can stream at such a high quality. For those of you that are watching on Instagram, you know, uh, you know, this stream is also taking place on YouTube. There's a link in my highlights that'll, that'll take you to, uh, to a much higher quality stream than the one you're you're watching now. Uh, but for the YouTube watchers, you're in a sense in the right place because you're getting this in like 1080p and I'm also able to at the same time, you know, screen record this uh, in 4K because I have this, this Cintiq that I'm working on. So eventually I'll, I'll probably make a version of this available in, in 4K. I don't think you'll be missing much between like 4K and what you're seeing now, but still, if I have the possibility, why not, right? So Naeem is asking, different regions have different styles of drawing and teaching methods. Does it affect your, does it, does it influence your drawing style? Can you adopt other regions of styles? even if you didn't learn it academically. Ooh, it's kind of a cool question because it's kind of getting at the, at the kind of style question, but in a, in a kind of more subtle way than I usually hear it. So uh, cool question. 
Now, I've spent some of my life kind of, I guess you would say, uh, kind of self-taught. And then a lot of my life, uh, you know, I spent at the academy in Florence. And so uh, I've been kind of on both sides of that, where you're kind of on the outside looking in, trying to figure out, like, what, what are these people doing that, like, makes their work so good? Uh, I don't know what it is because I haven't gone to school, so so I can't like say confidently that I know. Um, but how do you like how do you deal with that? Um, so it's kind of a cool question. I think that there's two things. When you don't have an option, you just take what you can do. Um, before I went and studied in Italy, and and I'm from America, of course. So uh, before I went and studied in Italy. All I could do, really, was just to look around at at the work that I saw being produced, and this is in the kind of early 2000s, the late 90s, where I was kind of starting to get into this stuff. So all I could do, really, was just look at what they were doing and uh, uh, what different artists were doing and try to do the same thing. And, you know, that's totally valid. That being said, I feel like in retrospect, I, I, I worked so hard uh, to get information that or to to figure things out that are really like baseline standard stuff at, at a proper academy, uh, or at least at the, the school that I went to. So I think that you should try your best to get some kind of foundation somewhere. Right, uh, whatever whatever is kind of possible to you in terms of um, figuring out just some basic ideas. And again, this was late '90s, so uh, and early 2000s. So remember, what is available to you now is <laughs> not what was available then. Uh, you know, there was a couple of videos maybe by like David LaFell um, out there that you could watch, maybe. If you're into illustration things, maybe Glenn Vilpu was like already doing stuff. Uh, so, you know, the whole like online scene was really, um, really at, at such an early point there. Um, and even even so, like I didn't even really know about kind of online learning. So, uh, to answer your question, I would say try to get a hold of some like foundations courses, right? Which uh, again, a lot of different artists out there are offering some version of this. I'm actually going to be making my own um, via live workshops for my Patreon. Like I'm about to start a kind of longer kind of curriculum based uh, uh, program where I'm going to take people through all of like the basic like essential things that you have to know about drawing if you're going to figure out how to do this well. So uh, after that, after you have the, that foundation in place, I think then you're much, much more able to, to kind of gather things on your own after that. But, you know, before that, I just, I think it's really hard. Like I had a hard time kind of gathering things. I would try to like paint like David LaFell. Oh my God, it was so, it was so bad. Uh, um, I wish I could share those with you, like my early paintings. I think I've probably destroyed them all at some point um <laughs> uh but uh but yeah so uh, get some fundamentals uh, get some basics and then then try to learn like more on your own i think so let's see a lot of questions coming in uh what are some books that you recommend uh does learning art from books is it a good way and uh how many sketches would I make in a day? Um, sketches I make in a day would be easy. I, I can't probably do more than one. I, again, I think I'm really slow, uh, especially being like a, a kind of uh, new guy on the block in terms of like my digital abilities. Um, so I'm not like, I know a friend of mine works in like game design and he says like on a slow day, he's making like three paintings in a day. So I'm definitely not at that pace <laughs> at all. Uh, I have a long, uh, long way to go before I, be, before I would be that fast. Um, even if I'm working like in analog 
you know, if I'm working just with pencil and paper, graphite and paper, which is what I'm, you know, I'm much more kind of known for working that way. Uh, even then, probably I could make, you know, one really good sketch a day, uh, maybe three hours or so. Um, then in terms of like books that I would recommend, but it's interesting, right? Because a lot of great books are out there because it was like the primary medium for learning at a certain point. Now, of course, like video has totally surpassed that. And I think that probably learning from books in one sense, it, this sounds horrible. This is, or you guys can come at me for this if you want to, but learning from books is like a little bit outdated in terms of drawing. That being said, now, now I brought up these older books at first because I wanted to mention a lot of like really great artists when they were teaching books were the primary mode. And so there's some great, 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 great information uh, kind of locked up in books. So I wouldn't abandon them. But also, you know, you just understand like you've got a lot of options out there. You know, you're not, it's not like you, you, don't, you need to go to the book route uh, to kind of get get the information a lot of it, great video stuff out there um but in relationship to the books that i think are interesting anything by harold speed uh, is going to be fantastic uh, he actually manages to make all this academic stuff sound or or, or read in a really compelling way <laughs> um there's a book by vanderpool for instance that I I love Vanderpool and I love his work and I think he's an amazing artist and like all these things I could not read the Vanderpool book because I just found it too it's it's very bland it comes from this moment where like in the 19th century and this is my understanding of it where there was this big ethic of uh, like scientific discovery and scientific understanding of things and so because of that, his text is like really meticulously written, almost like he's trying to describe in a laboratory environment <laughs> what drawing uh, sounds like. That, that's just my take. This is, you know, I mean, everybody's going to have like a different take on, on, on Vanderpool. Uh, I want to reiterate, I think it's amazing, but I couldn't get through the book. Uh, as I found the writing of it like pretty dry. Harold Speed, I found really uh really kind of um dynamic easy to read so so i it's always my kind of go-to when people ask me let's see wow a lot of questions coming in i'm not gonna be able to get them all um someone says i've been doing art for three years i learned almost entirely from youtube creators and i'm looking for looking at visuals trying to understand it um yeah it's basically talking about the book idea that i was talking about yeah Someone's also saying Scott Robertson's book on perspective is really good. I might have to check that out. I've been kind of, uh, you know, figuring out. I didn't, you know, at a school that I went to, I didn't have, like, really, there wasn't a perspective course, which I know, like, sounds, that sounds kind of crazy, I bet, <laughs> that you can go to, like, an art school as long as I did, and, like, perspective was not a thing. But it was not a thing. Or at least not, like, formally addressed. Like, you know, maybe we talk about it a little bit, but, uh, again, it was not totally a part of our education you know we were much more concerned actually with uh, in a way actually just rendering things you know figuring out how the human form works so a lot of anatomy a lot of uh, a lot of cast drawing so things a little bit more like that were or what I was primarily educated to do and you know you gotta remember as well there's a lot of and I I'm probably I'm sure some of you have done some atelier training uh, so this is like kind of speaking to you out there as well. You know, I thought that if I just like kind of learned to draw, and this is like the younger me, if I just learned to draw, then like the other stuff was kind of, I feel like I felt like it was kind of wrapped up in that. Like if I learned to draw, then, you know, perspective would make sense to me uh, or, or that I could be prepared in a way to do lots of different kind of work just by figuring out how to draw. It's not the case. These are individual skills, and while learning to draw, uh, as I learned to draw, I think is a great assistance in terms of preparing you to learn other very complex things like perspective, 
it does not guarantee that you will be able to draw environments or or elaborate imaginative work stuff like that uh, um, you need a, a separate skill set to do that so uh, and and then this is back like just to everybody just remember that the way that you train the kind of work that you train to do is the kind of work that you'll be able to make so if you want to make really big imaginative stuff you need to train in that with that in mind uh, um, or at least if you want to use your time the most efficient way but also you know and this this goes to uh, something I would say to students as well I think always always look at your teachers work uh, and this is kind of, it can be a bit of a divisive opinion because there are some teachers out there that are like great teachers and they're not the best artists so it's not that I'm saying like you need to study with a person whose art is the the coolest or the best, the most popular. But I think that you need to look at the ideas represented in their work. If you want to make like highly refined drawings and paintings, you don't want to study with a teacher whose work is always about sketches. It just wouldn't make sense, right? I mean, so, but I, I'm saying there's probably a lot of you out there you know, especially nowadays, probably a lot of you are like way smarter than I was <laughs> when I was a student. Uh, I think I was like just this young kid who like skateboarding and, you know, punk rock music. And I was, anyway, whatever, I was who I was when I was a kid. So I didn't really kind of grasp um, some of these things when I was kind of going to study, which is probably why I, I kind of recommend to people to try to understand them a little bit better before they go into it. Yeah, but... Let's see, some more questions here. Uh, yeah, so someone's saying they also started out like kind of doing graffiti uh, when they were younger, and that's how they kind of got into the uh, got into the art world. Um, and what to kind of work on in terms of draftsman skills or painting skills first. I'll tell you what you gotta learn to draw like there's really no other way about it and uh i remember i was talking to somebody you know, I've, like i said i've been teaching in ateliers for like uh let's see since like 2000 and uh 2008 so for for quite a while i remember a guy was asking me he had studied with me for uh, uh, at the academy for a little while and he was um, he then left and went back to India for a while and uh, he was trying to figure out like what school he wanted to go to after he needed to kind of take a pause and he was kind of going to go back to be to finish his education but not to Florence and he was you know wrote me an email asking like what you know basically like what should I get into like how do I you know how do I negotiate this like what do I need to be an artist and stuff and these kinds of questions and I remember I said at the time, and I, I really kind of stick by this, not a lot of people really learn to draw. You know, there are people that learn uh, about drawing and they can learn, you know, some ideas, uh, you know, they can figure out how to kind of get a picture onto the paper. But I'm talking about like really learning to draw. Very few people uh, get down to the the absolute uh deepest kind of level there and it's it's always my opinion that what you gain in kind of really figuring out how to draw ultimately is a tremendous amount of versatility uh, you can you can <laughs> it sounds funny you can do anything if you learn how to draw in a way like visually you know you're you're so much better equipped that being said and this is this is the other side of the coin right if you're going into like the kind of commercial market uh, and you know time is a factor for you then you know painting takes a long time to figure out and so if you spend a lot of time early on figuring out how paint works just as a material, as a substance, then you'll be prepared probably a little bit sooner to, to make artwork that is like viable for the market. 
I don't know how many out of you out there are like professional or that you're showing your work other places and, and things like that. But there's this is oh, this is gonna sound really snobby. I, I don't mean it to sound snobby, but there's work that's really kind of commercially viable that isn't so like we wouldn't look at it and think, wow, that's really like accomplished work. Uh and that's okay. Like, not everybody has to be to some ridiculous standard of design or whatever it is. Uh, and I already know that sounds like already snobby. I'm like cringing at myself saying it. But, um, you know, if if that's the objective is to get to the market as fast as possible, then spending your time with paint is really useful because, you know, paint is what generally galleries want. Uh, the galleries, in my experience, that want to work with people making drawings are a lot fewer and further in between than those that want to work with oil painters. I hope that helps and doesn't sound too cynical. Uh, someone's asking, what's the road to really learn how to draw? How do we know uh, we're at the right path? Well, the, the, the road to really learning how to draw is just long, first of all. <laughs> you just have to be first... You have to, to be very patient and you have to have the time to be patient. Not everybody, like I said, uh, not everybody's career is going to give them the, the time to, to do that. How do you know you're on the right path? Again, that, that does come down to a little bit of kind of knowing yourself uh, because you do need to like look at, look at the work of who you're studying with. And like I said, I know that's like a difficult thing as well because for a student, a lot of times you kind of, and this is, this is like really... I wish someone had given me this advice. You don't know what you don't know. And so things that sometimes seem like a little bit crazy, like, you know, a teacher will tell you, really, you've got to understand this thing. And you're going, I just don't see it. And they're telling you, no, you're making this mistake. And you're going, no, but listen, I don't see it. How can that be true? You are, you are locked into the extent of what you you understand already withdrawing and painting your knowledge as your knowledge gets deeper you're going to be able to see more and more so a lot of times as a teacher you're kind of telling people things like listen you gotta you gotta see this thing you gotta understand you know you really need to kind of work in this area um if you're going to kind of grow and so as a student you do have to have a certain amount of like faith in in your teacher for for that fact so uh, that's why I say, you know, look at your teacher's work. You know, if, if it's a place that you want to get to, then, then listening to them is really worth, worthwhile. You know, if you look at your work and you say, they do this thing really, really well, I want to do that thing really well, then just be patient and listen to what they have to say because they're trying to get you to, uh, uh, to that place. But there's a lot of destinations. So some people tell me that I must draw old art for my portfolio. I want to go to art college and taking the fine art courses. Is that true? Well, you know, that's, that's one of those. I don't know if I can really answer that question just because it's kind of um, what art college are you going to, you know? <laughs> uh, you, know what, you know, what is your objective? Because you've got so many, like, variables inside of that, unfortunately. Like, probably, I don't know if I could, like, really shed light on... Uh, or give you like an insight that would apply for sure. You know, I mean, uh, also like the, the whole thing of, of like going to a school, I think it's interesting. Like I went to an art school before I went, I studied in Italy. So like I went to like this American art school and you know, there's the whole like portfolio game there. Like you need to have this portfolio and you, you do this thing and whatever. And not to, you know, denigrate that process at all because, you know, it depends upon what your goal is. I never really used anything about my portfolio after I applied. That was kind of it. And I don't really know if I knew enough at the time to to necessarily have like even made a that, that good of a portfolio. Um, but suffice to say, like the making of a portfolio is for the school you want to go to. It's not for your necessarily for your personal growth. 
I mean, it can help you grow for sure. And, and learning that maybe there's some hoops that you have to jump through in life is, by the way, that's, that's all right to learn that as well. Uh, you know, I mean, I think for artists, and this is kind of an interesting question too, I think for artists, I was talking to my wife about this, she's, she's a painter as well. We kind of start out with this vague idea that we're going to like, we're going to paint and then that's what we're going to spend our life doing. And in a way, like, of course, we were kind of right about that. We do paint and we teach and that's like what we spend our lives doing. But there's so much more to that, more to like making a living than than just that, than just like painting. And for students, sometimes I think you're in a really tough spot that you kind of don't have enough information to really like know what the career is all about uh, and, and how you're going to kind of survive out there. Uh, also because there's kind of this conception that like artists and money shouldn't mix that. And it's actually kind of a, um, I think it's an idea. I was listening to this lecture by Ad Nerdrin the other day. And uh, he was talking about Immanuel Kant, uh, as he always does. And uh, he was talking about like this idea that, that Kant had and, and that, that Kant produced that great art was also uh, reflect, would reflect great politics or would be very moral in a sense, uh, or according to anyway, Kant's morals. And so it kind of gives you this idea that artists are in some ways like they are, uh, they are like activists but I think that probably the reality for certainly a lot of like artists that I know and, and artists that I work with is, is that you're really, you're a small business owner. Like you, you need to keep the lights on. You need to make work and produce work and have a, a way to sell that work. And, uh, you know, that's what your job kind of is. So the reality eventually for for people in the industry i think it's a little bit different from like our first notions as art students of like w what we're going to do when we when we finish becoming artists if that's <laughs> if that's even like a thing that we can we can talk about uh so yeah so i missed a lot of questions in in answering that one but uh let's see someone's asked fun fun up few not is asking how much of your traditional skills have transferred over to digital? What is the main difference? I think a lot of my trend, uh, um, actually, let's say that in a way, all of my traditional skills went into digital because I think I use digital work in an analog way. Like you can see like everything that I'm doing this drawing is just it's just a single brush. And uh, all I'm doing is just um, just drawing just as I would draw you know, with, uh, with a graphite pencil, um, uh, not, not anything at all different from that. So for me, the transition is good. However, I have worked with a friend, I was collaborating with a friend of mine who's like way more kind of Photoshop savvy than, uh, than I am or, or than I'm likely ever to be. Uh, he was getting really frustrated with me actually, because I was, I was drawing, you know, with these, I was like kind of putting in these textures, uh, and eventually, like, he, he told me, like, I, I just don't understand what you're doing because, like, they're cool textures that you're putting in, but, you know, like, that's not, it doesn't make any sense to do that right now. And I was like, well, I don't understand why. Apparently, like, with Photoshop, you can just put in textures after you've done all the other design, which is just not something that I even knew existed. So... <laughs> Uh, to answer your question, uh, I think all of my analog skills have remained, mostly because I am just drawing like I would in an analog world. Uh, so, yeah, if you really want to learn like Photoshop stuff, uh, once again, there's probably a lot of people out there that could tell you a lot more than I could, for sure. Uh, maybe Todd is saying, I'm learning to draw from you and practicing violin. Would you like... And we'd like to hear your advice. Would it be best to focus on one thing? Also, would love to see your you on Proko's Draftsman podcast. Yeah, I was uh, oddly enough, I was talking to. I've I've done some work with uh, Stan Prokopenko, and 
when I saw that he was having on guests, uh, I shot him a text and I was like, hey man, like why, <laughs> why haven't you texted me? It was like the first guest he had. And I was like, come on, you knew I'd, I'd want to be on the podcast. Uh, and so we're, hopefully we're, we're, we're in the works to, to do something on the podcast. Um, but in terms of like practicing multiple disciplines, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, because when I, I was doing this stuff, I was obviously quite single-minded. I didn't, didn't have any other interests. I didn't do anything else. But I think that, well, I've known like a teacher of mine, right? For instance, there's um, an artist who, uh, I've actually still kept up with him uh, from my days in Florence. Uh, his name's Ramiro Sanchez. Uh, he's a Venezuelan guy. And he had like a Jesuit education as a, uh, as a child and was uh, already like aware of like, you know, classicism and like all of this, like to my mind, like really sophisticated stuff. Much more so than I was uh, when I went through, through the academy. Um, and he played the viola which I think is like kind of really cool, you know? Uh, so I, I think actually it would be really nice to uh, have done multiple things in that time. I think, you know, when you're younger, when you, I was about to say when you're young, I'm only 40, like, so I'm not like super old, uh, but maybe for you guys watching, maybe 40 is already really, really old. But, you know, I think that when you, when you pick something up when you're a little bit younger, I think you just have... Um, you have kind of more time and energy uh, for picking those things up. And so I think use it, you know, go for it. Uh, I don't think you will regret also learning to play the, the violin while you're, while you're studying. Uh, however, you could regret not doing it. So I say, uh, take the risk and um, I would say learn it also. Yeah. Let's see. Have you dealt with some prolonged periods of inactivity before and the subsequent feeling of missing some skill or having to build up again? How do you deal with that, if so? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting, right? So when I was at school, we would work in uh, what's called trimesters. So there would be like three uh, terms per year. And after each term, you would have, you know, uh, if it was Christmas, you'd have a couple weeks off if it was uh, if it was summer you'd have like uh, a few months off uh, actually so you know you'd have time off I mean I always was I was a bit like obsessive um, which honestly probably to get really good at this stuff I think you have to be a little bit I think you have to be a little bit obsessive um, that's kind of a blanket statement but I'm pretty sure I would stand by that that you have to be a little bit obsessive to eventually get really really good at this stuff but what I was gonna say was that after we come back from those breaks there would always be like a lot of conversation uh, in the model room about you know shaking the rust off or you know some version of that that uh, like oh we need to warm back up and I you know maybe I'm just a little bit like skeptical about it maybe it was just me, you know, being like a, a kind of high achieving personality type where like I just, I put a lot of pressure on myself to, to be able to do stuff. I always like thought, well, it's just kind of a myth, right? That we, that we get rusty. Um, because to me, like drawing is so much about, about the concepts. And if you know the concepts, your brain shouldn't get rusty. I mean, maybe your hand gets a little bit rusty, but your brain should be, uh, you shouldn't have uh, that problem. That being said, I'm sure that you can get a little bit rusty. Um, I just, maybe, <laughs> maybe in an unhealthy way, I, like I just wouldn't acknowledge it. You know, I just, I just try to work through it. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Sorry about that. Yeah, I just had to, uh, I think my phone like ran out of battery. So 
Uh, my Instagram stream has ended. All right, so how long have we been doing this? I don't even know how long we've uh, been here. 64 minutes, just an hour. I've got some more time if, uh, if you guys do. What do you think? Do we keep going? Or do we wrap it up? <laughs> I don't know like what your capacity is to like sit around and watch this stuff. How long do live streams normally go? That's my, that's my question for, uh, for all of you out there who have um, much more experience uh, watching YouTube than I do. All right, so we have one that says keep going. So that's one vote for, for keeping going. Um, let's see what the rest is. Definitely keep going. <laughs> Someone's saying they usually go 24 hours on the short side. <laughs> I feel like I feel like I'm being taken advantage of there. I feel like that's not that's probably not true. No, but I'll keep going. Also, my wife is working in the same studio. I gotta see if like if this is bothering her to the extent that she can't work. So uh, we'll see if uh, see if that's okay. All right, let me get serious about this eye. I don't know if I've been uh, to like really kind of dive in. I don't know, by the way, I was asked a question earlier about like how often do you squint? You probably see me do it like quite a bit right now. Um, just trying to f figure out like where my values are, um, just in terms of their unity versus variety. Also, you know, I, I find that you know, one of the things that I really like, uh, actually, about working digitally, and there's there's a lot that I find kind of enjoyable. Even though, you know, if you ask me, I think. You know, like I feel, you know, like a novice in a way, like digitally, I, I don't feel particularly accomplished. What I do like, as I said before, was the kind of how easy it is to like kind of communicate. Um, you know, you can like, you know, this live stream is so much more accessible, I think, when you work digitally uh, um, than, than like an analog stream. At least I find that. Uh, I'm sure other people have done a really good job uh, with analog streams as well. Probably, I don't know, probably I'll do that uh, eventually as well, uh, but it's just not yet. So someone's asking about learning about uh, composition and perspective. Uh, composition perspective, you know, really kind of merit their own classes, I would say. So uh, my advice to you would be like, don't underestimate uh, either of those topics because they need their own like full set of like uh, instructions and lectures and and also practice because you've got to remember that hearing a lecture about something and knowing how to do it uh, are totally different things. Uh, and it's really important, I think, that you understand that drawing and painting, uh, they are practical um, goals, right? They're, it's about practical learning. So it needs to be something you can implement before that you say that you, that you understand it. You know, you get this with students all the time, I swear they'll go like, be telling them, about this concept and going, yeah, no, we need to focus on this. So, yeah, no, no, I understand that, that concept. But the reality is like, if they did understand the concept, probably I wouldn't be talking to them about it because I would understand on their, on their work, on their painting or drawing that they already understand it. So, um, yeah, like I said, uh, I, I would feel like just give the topics the absolute uh, respect that they deserve and um, address them from top to bottom with uh, with an expert, which I am not an expert in in um, in perspective. 
so I will not be able to take you on that journey. Yeah, someone's asking, uh, how do you decide whether to call a painting done? Well, that's <sighs> done is um, complicated because you also have to take into account your effective ability to continue pursuing a project. Like for me, I eventually have like a, a shut off point where my enthusiasm for a project closes and if I continue working, I'm going to be doing like kind of half work. Like it's not going to be great work that I'm doing. It's just like, I'm just there kind of, kind of working, not maybe being totally focused. So I try to take into account, you know, how much I feel like I'm actually able to do, uh, how, how much I'm able to, how effective I'm able to be, uh, given my enthusiasm for a project. That being said, you know, it's not maybe a great uh, habit to get into to just go, oh, well, my enthusiasm has gone. I can't work on this anymore. Uh, because eventually you need to like grow that, that muscle. You need to exercise that, uh, that, that discipline of, of working, not only when you're inspired, but working when you're not inspired as well. Uh, so I usually try to make it a bit more of like a procedural thing. So like with a painting, for instance, like an oil painting, I will, uh, I will generally work for like three layers. Uh, so three passes on the painting. And if I feel like after that, like I still haven't gotten the thing that I'm trying to get, I really have to start wondering, you know, am I really going to get it? Uh, or is more time, is it just going to be more time? You know, like uh, you can spend a lot of time with a painting and, and, and not have anything good happening to it. So uh, for me, I just try to figure out, uh, <laughs> I just try to figure out if I still have the it in me to kind of keep going. Someone's asking if, um, as a graffiti question, asking if I'm too adult uh, to go out tagging anymore. Uh, <laughs> the answer is absolutely. I am far too adult to go out tagging anymore. Um, also that, you know, I'm a, a permanent resident uh, in, in Norway. And I think if I was arrested here doing anything, I, I think probably they would not allow me to stay in the country. So I think tagging is probably out of the question. It's been out of the question for probably a lot of years now already, but I still have a deep affection for it. Baby Todd is asking... What is your advice on studying your Patreon videos and how would you go about it yourself if you hadn't gone to Florence and was all you were studying? I think with Patreon, this is, this is something that is a little bit, uh, in my opinion, probably underutilized by my Patreon subscribers. Uh, but I am there for you guys and girls. If you got questions, you know, I'm in the comments like every day uh, answering whatever questions are there. So... Obviously, you need to kind of know a little bit your level. So I make um, some some beginning videos or beginners videos, uh, and then I make some more advanced videos. Uh, so kind of knowing which one of those you want to be studying is important. Uh, but then after that, like ask for a clarification, ask ask questions about it, and um, and and kind of get responses from me because once again, like I'm there, you know, every day. Um, available to uh, uh, to answer whatever questions you got. Um, otherwise, uh, the other thing, and I'm hoping that that everybody also already understands this. Uh, my Patreon page has uh, an extra navigation site, so I, I hired a company to um, to kind of custom uh, or customize uh, a website for me where I can. Um, make it a lot easier for people to find the tutorials that they're looking for. Like Patreon's basic navigation is was kind of basic. Um, and, and so not really, uh, that, that great, not that user friendly. Um, 
so in that on that website there's also a filtering system where you can uh, choose to see just the uh, you can choose to see just the basic or sorry the beginners the foundation videos uh, so I would start out with those and uh, make sure that you use my time because that's once again that is exactly what I'm there for um, there to kind of uh, help everybody get the most out of that page yeah someone's asking if I've ever given silver point a try I have not personally though I did buy my wife a silver point drawing kit once upon a time uh, so it's like gessoed paper and you get like a little two millimeter silver pin that you can put into a two, two millimeter lead holder though I'm not sure if she ever used it <laughs> um, someone's asking uh, did art affect your social life that's a good question uh, did art affect my social well I met my wife you know, through studying, so I guess to that to that extent, you know, it affected that part of my social life. <laughs> um, my married life is is because of uh, studying. She she's looking over at me now that I'm talking about it. They're asking if uh, um, artwork uh, affected my social life, and I said, well, I I met my wife when I was studying, so. I guess, and uh, to that extent, it has definitely affected my social life. <laughs> Which my social life now consists of like going on long walks on foggy mornings. Because of, uh, of course, COVID, we don't see anybody. Someone was asking, do you do a sketch before doing a painting? This is a very kind of cool question. I absolutely do a lot of uh, a lot of preparatory work when it is a painting that is more than purely observational which is to say that sometimes you know i'll find myself wanting to do something a little bit more imaginative the more that i have to imagine the more sketching i do uh, because uh, once again when you're a professional there are consequences of being inefficient and so uh, you know, if I spend a week on a painting and then kind of nothing comes out of that painting, uh, no outcome is arrived to, that's, that's really hard to justify um, nowadays. And so uh, when I have to do, when I need to get to the imagination station, I really need to make sure that I'm not, I'm not going to like just spend my time on basically a project that that never arrives uh, so yes absolutely I do if I'm doing a portrait where you know and I've I've been you know working on portraiture for uh, many 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 years now um, usually I don't really need to do a sketch if I'm doing in general like pretty standard head study uh, so not always, but again, if I have to be imaginative and, uh, and it's a work that is consequential, uh, absolutely, I will do a, a studies beforehand. Someone's asking, uh, how do you get such 3D and clean portraits? Well, I don't know, it's clean portraits. Well, you know, first of all, I mean, this is not going to be too edifying of an answer but obviously it's just practice you know uh, so much of you know confidence in artwork and style in artwork is just being kind of comfortable in your own skin and and for me a lot of that is you know that I've just been there before um, when I was younger I wasn't and, and less experienced I was not nearly so confident about what I was doing and so, of course, that was um, a more difficult time to be to be creative for me. Um, but as time goes on, you get a little bit more confident. And so, and I'm speaking now, by the way, to you're asking uh, about, you know, kind of clean portraits. Uh, there's a great saying by 
uh, an artist called uh, Joshua Reynolds. And he said that it was, it was like giving advice to students. He said, essentially, I suggested you block in your, your drawing or your painting or whichever it was in such a way that you don't have to change it afterwards. And like on the surface, I used to laugh about this. On the surface, that sounds like <laughs> like the most kind of jerky advice you can get. Like, cause yeah, of course, like, we're, aren't we all just trying to block in our portrait in such a way that we don't have to change it afterwards? Like, I don't find myself blocking something in going, I hope I have to change this afterwards. Um, but really what he's saying is that if you're doing things in the right way, you should be able to progress through a project without making kind of dramatic changes. You should be able to progress rather smoothly through a portrait. Uh, obviously making little uh, embellishments as you go, but not necessarily making what you would think of as uh, corrections or correcting mistakes. And so that was the point that he was trying to make, at least to, to my mind. And now I think it's fantastic. I think it's amazing advice, actually. I think it's one of like, the best advices that you can give is, technically speaking, I suggested you block in the portrait in such a way that you don't have to change it afterwards. But that comes down to, I think, something really interesting as well. And, and this is, you know, take this for what it is. You know, um, 40 years old, I've been in atelier-based education since I was like 24. You know, great advice is as much about the student as it is about the teacher. Uh, because you can give amazing advice to somebody who's just checked out, just not really interested, and it can go completely without utility. Um, and on the other side, you can give kind of mediocre advice to a, a really invested person who's really there to like focus and learn and they will take it and make something they will discover some like depth in it right so i think if you're studying or you're aspiring you want to be somebody who's looking for the value in the advice that they're getting you know i'm a little bit of like a contrarian uh, i have been throughout my life and so i do find myself sometimes like hearing something and first to thinking what's wrong with it instead of thinking, you know, in a way, what's right about it? You know, what, what is the, the useful thing that I can apply out of this? And I think if you're going to be a great student, you want to, uh, you want to be on the, the latter side of that. You want to be somebody who's hearing something and, and finding the value in it. And I think it's, it's also the challenge for online students. It's one of the primary challenges. I tell this to, to all the people that, that, that I work with is that, you know, all of the different voices that you're hearing, I think that's the challenge for like online students. Not that, you know, that creates an impossible situation, but that you need to reconcile them all together because they're going to sound like they're saying different things. And you even experienced this at, at, at the atelier where I studied as well. Like you had several different teachers and one would say something and you'd think that sounds like the opposite of what the last one said but it turns out when you start to kind of look more deeply into it actually you, you find uh, you find actually how they're they're kind of saying the same thing you find the middle ground but you have to be listening you know you have to be kind of paying attention you have to be searching for for what that kind of truth in the advice is and if you're not probably you miss it and that's okay, you know, not, not everybody has to be like a perfect student. I wasn't a perfect student. Uh, but just, you know, in terms of like advice for students, I would say, look for the value in, in what you're hearing everywhere. You know, look for the commonalities, looking for, uh, you know, look for the things that, uh, that, you can, that you can find use in, right? Because you're already there, you're already listening, you're already hearing it. So, uh, Search for what's what's useful inside of it, what what gives you value, what helps you progress. I hope that helps. Uh, let's see. 
the um, someone's asking how do you maintain proportions when your drawing is bigger than your reference I think that uh, well it's I want to give a more useful answer than you know just that you pay attention to them but uh, you know if we're drawing like a portrait for instance uh, there's a lot about like head structure that, that I do in terms of like you know using construction methods to ensure that I have like the right value or sorry not the right value but the right proportion uh, and that I mean it's it's a lot to, to say about that but I you know what I mean like there's a whole I give a whole workshop about just you know how to construct a head so it's not really something I can answer like in just a second or, or just kind of show you uh, straight away um, and if you are interested in in all of that information it's um, it was actually like I, I put about 20 minutes out of it uh, uh, out of a, a two and a half three hour workshop out on YouTube so it, it is out there for free like you can totally check it out and just uh, see if you like it or not uh, but I use uh, constructive methods to ensure that I um, have a solid sense of proportions throughout my uh, work, regardless of the size of the reference that I, that I have. So that would be my, yeah, my advice to you would be, yeah, that. Someone's asking, uh, how does the speed of your work change? Have you always been this fast um, from day to day? Is it different? Um, no, I don't think it's very different. I mean, you can have a day where you, you mess things up less, you know, so that's good. Uh, but usually my speed is, is pretty, it's pretty uniform. It's not, doesn't go like up and down a whole lot. I just kind of draw the way that, uh, that I draw. I guess it kind of depends upon the, what my end point is. If I'm intent upon doing like a more finished drawing, uh, certainly that's going to take uh, a longer time but otherwise it's it's relatively even yeah but I think that uh, I think that probably I've got to wrap up uh, as we've done done about 87 minutes 90 minutes an hour and a half of live stream so I got to a place with this not a place that I think is amazing. Uh, I think there's a lot more drawing to be done to this eye if uh, if we were going to call it uh, a good drawing. But I think that there was some like cool Q and A's in there, and uh, also some uh, some decent drawing. By the way, like if you're watching this right now, um, definitely remember to subscribe to my channel so you get notifications when I'm doing live streams and stuff. And if you want to share that. On social media please feel free to do so uh, anything that helps the numbers go up is a positive thing for me and if you're interested in doing this stuff like really in depth and you want like a hundred hours of content about how I draw and paint my patreon page is uh, filled 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 with uh, uh, complete long-form tutorials so thank you so much everybody for for checking this out and uh, I'll see you in the next one